This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh. I think in a maths course you will have you will have examined whether sine whether sine n omega naught t and cos m omega naught t you know, how you prove that the integral of a product of those is equal to zero. I'm not intending to go through that. It's basically application of trigonometric identities and you rearrange. But fundamentally, the underlying idea is that you can't, you just can't represent one of those signals in terms of the other. It's a natural extension that complex phases are orthogonal of each other as well. So over one period, if I took a phasor uh, e to the j m omega naught t, and I multiplied it by a different building block, a different phasor, e to the j and omega naught t. So I'm assuming that the frequencies of these phasors are different. So in that case, m is not equal to n, then they are orthogonal. Okay, so you might want to try and prove this as an exercise. That's dead easy, uh, even more so than sines and coses. Because when you've got sines and coses, you have to dig out your trig identities. What's cos A times cos B? I mean, you sort of scratch your head and think it's something like half of cos A plus B and half of sine A minus B with some minus signs here, there, and everywhere. Um, whereas with the exponential, of course, you just multiply them together. You know how to integrate an exponential, and it's a relatively straightforward proof. If M and N are equal, then actually what you're doing is multiplying the same waveform. And so, of course, you can always represent a waveform in terms of itself, because that's by definition. So therefore, when m is equal to n, it happens to equal 1. Now, there's a nice little conjugate sign which crops up in here, uh, which is a complex conjugate. So just be aware, I mean, some people use put a bar above a symbol to indicate uh, if it's complex conjugate or not. Uh, just while I've got it on my head, I went to look up why the set of integers uh, it's denoted by Z. And it's on Wikipedia, so you can go and have a look. But does anyone know? Is anyone German here? Because uh, that would help. But Z, Z stands for German word, which means number. <laughs> and that's why the set of integers is denoted by Z. So that must have been linked to, it's probably a famous German mathematician at some point. So there's always a reason for these. They're not actually just letters which come out of uh, nowhere. Now, OK, so that's an aside. The complex conjugate, you might go, why is it in there? Good question. So, again, I'm not quite sure what you've covered up to this course, but the reason it's there is for consistency, and it's just a way that complex numbers and functions are manipulated. So, obviously, the complex phasor is a complex function, therefore, uh, and I, I need to deal with it in a different way. And I think as an analogy, um, the thi I mean, the thing that I'm aware of in electrical engineering is that if you were to work out power and you had a complex voltage and a complex current, then it's, for example, V times I conjugate, right? Now, I don't know if you've done that. I don't know. Have you done complex? When you come into power in a later course, probably next year, you'll be doing complex currents and complex... We're right now, but we're multiplying by cosine, cosine and sine. Right, OK. So that will end up if you... Uh, they're basically equivalent representations. So, yes. Uh, this would be a bit like with a dot product formula. The then you might take um, the magnitude of E times the magnitude of I times cos, ca times cos theta. And that's the analogy with the dot product, which I wrote up here. So the equivalent for the dot product is V transpose times U. But actually, if you change that into complex form, it will be V emission times U. And you end up with complex voltages and complex phases. And and that's the connection. So really, you know, if I go sticking an arbitrary conjugate sign in there, it's not entirely arbitrary. It's something that does crop up across all ma engineering mathematical analysis. Now, what's the point of this orthogonality? So I know you did this in maths, and really the key point is sines and cosines are by far not the only orthogonal set of basis functions out there. And in fact, there are others. So up till now, you've been taught that we, sh we can analyze a periodic signal decomposing it in terms of sines and cosines, but in fact, there are alternatives. And if you happen to have the tutorial sheet, 
So you can now basically do exercise 2.9, which is a four star, and just that's a four star because it requires you to think a little bit. So it's not actually outrageously difficult, it just requires you to stop and think. And that discusses um, decomposing uh, this waveform at the bottom, which is a rectified sinusoid, in terms of these functions at the top here, which are called Walsh functions. So Walsh functions are fascinating things because they form an orthogonal basis set. So I could take any waveform that is periodic, and if I carried on that set of orthogonal functions, I could represent any waveform as a linear combination of these Walsh functions. But the fantastic thing about these Walsh functions are that they consist of only ones and minus ones. Uh, basically zero mean. You could do it as ones and zeros with a, a DC offset, but they only consist of binary values. Now why is that important? Well that's because it, it then makes it trivial to design a circuit which could synthesize a signal using basic waveforms like this. So if I had to synthesize part of a speech signal which is periodic, I could try and generate a sequence of sinusoids and cosinusoids and add them together to get that part of a speech signal. Or I could synthesize binary signals and add them together as well. Right, I was looking for this diagram, which was back on uh, summary slide 9. You know, I, I mentioned you could go into TL, into the electronics lab, and if I wanted to synthesize a signal, I could pinch every single signal generator in there and generate sines and cosines of different frequencies, add them all together. But one thing I didn't discuss when putting that as a pretty non-practical suggestion, but as a possibility, is how easy is it to generate a sine and a cosine, which is an interesting question itself. So if you had to build an electronic circuit which synthesized a sine and a cosine, would you find it easy or not? There are ways of doing it. Um, usually it starts off from generating a binary signal in the first place, and then you probably filter it somehow to get the sine and the cosine. It's not, an utterly, it's not trivial to generate the sines and the cosines from nothing. Okay, it comes, it's easy in sort of for power stations because it comes naturally from uh, the mechanics of the system. But so yeah, which would you prefer, generating those sines and cosines or generating those rectangular pulses? That's a good question there, right? So Walsh functions are orthogonal. There are other sets of orthogonal, uh, orthogonal functions. I think if you have fun with one of last year's exam papers, there is a, a different set of orthogonal functions which are basically polynomials. Uh, so there is a orthogonal set of polynomials, a, so a linear term, a quadratic, a cubic term, and again you can decompose a waveform in terms of those. And the question is, you know, when, which, which are the best ones to use? Okay, if you come to something like audio coding or image coding, or if we go with image coding with M MP4, there's a signal decomposition, it's in two dimensions, because it's actually, well, because they're images, and that uses something called a wavelet transform. Now, a wavelet transform is quite a bit, it's not something we're going to cover. You might cover it briefly with Dave Lawrenson in the fourth year course if you do this, but it's a, it's a natural extension of a lot of what we're doing here. Okay, so sines and cosines are just not the only thing. Now, um, what's the, why, you might say, why don't I use Walsh functions all the time then? Anyone have a, good, have a suggestion why we might not use Walsh functions all the time? Uh, well, you can scale these. So one of the things is when you when you add building blocks, you're allowed to amplify each one. Um, hmm? uh, now, okay, the discontinuities can be a bit of an awkward issue. So obviously, as you keep adding these together, you're going to end up with what I'd call a staircase function, a bit like the output of a digital of a digital to analog converter before you filtered it. So yeah, that that's that's a potential issue. But yeah, pretty much the the main issue is that the approximation you get for a particular waveform, if you have a waveform and you want to make an arbitrary approximation using sines or using rectangular pulses, you need many, many more of the rectangular pulses to get as good an approximation as you can with the sines and cosines. So for some signals, sines and cosines are a more efficient representation in the sense that if you took the, the first 200 
coefficients and only use the first 200 harmonics, that would represent the signal much better than if you took the two, first 200 Walsh functions. And that's, that's the answer. However, there are other waveforms where using the first 200 Walsh functions will give you a better approximation. So if you've got a, a signal which really is sort of staircase in, in some way, or digital in some sense, or an out, yeah, it's a multi-alphabet signal, so something where, like the output of a digital to analog converter before filtering, then, yeah, the Walsh functions might be ideal. Okay, so you need to be sort of keep, keep an open mind on that. And even if Fourier is a more efficient representation, there might be applications where, uh, okay, so Fourier might be more efficient in terms of the number of coefficients you need, but the Walsh functions might be more efficient in terms of the implementation. So you might have, for example, a faster implementation on an FPGA because it's able to manipulate these binary signals more efficiently than it can sines and cosines. So there's always trade-offs between those two, and you want to open your eyes to those possibilities. So that's what exercise uh, 2.9 is about on that handout. Um, also, finally, the thing about 2.9 is that is an exam, pretty much exam style or exam level uh, tutorial question, okay, four star. Maybe slightly shorter than an exam style, but it's of a, the difficulty that you would get in a, a harder exam question. This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.